Hello, everyone, and welcome to this podcast episode. I'm uh, here today with a longtime friend and colleague, Peter Connor, and I'm really excited to have this conversation and to have all of you be able to join. Uh, I've known Peter for many years. We were engaged in spiritual life together. Uh, just a little bit about Peter. Uh, he has spent most of his life making money as a trader, so working in finance, and simultaneous to that has been uh, a longtime seeker involved with different teachers and different practices uh, for years. Uh, Peter and I became very close during about a four year period where we were in a small, uh, very intensive uh, group dedicated to spiritual growth and exploration and collective awakening. Uh, and we've maintained a friendship before and after that. And I always find Peter's perspectives uh, fascinating. And I know that now he's been opening up what he does to include uh, offering coaching services specifically designed to maximize uh, our performance as individuals in different ways. He's involved in theater, has directed and acted in the Chicago area where he lives. And I think you're going to enjoy our conversation. So first of all, Peter, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you, Jeff. I am very happy to be here. And for the benefit of, of everyone just getting to know you, I wonder if uh, we could start by just speaking about uh, maybe your introduction to spiritual life in the first place. How did you, how did you get on the path? Um, I think probably like many people, um, I got on the path because I was in a lot of pain. Um, and that pain started early in childhood. I ended up in rehab and, and AA when I was 16 years old. Um, and that was my introduction to any type of spiritual life. Um, and I since have, I was in AA for five years and, and ended up leaving. Um, but while there, I, I certainly got an introduction to a lot of different spiritual philosophies. When I left high school, I, I thought I was most interested in Buddhism. And so I went to move and live in Nepal, um, discovered very quickly that I wasn't a Buddhist <laughs> and <laughs> ended up coming back. Um, uh, and it went from there and, and got involved in, with different types of meditation and different meditation teachers, um, including the spiritual community you were so deeply engaged in. And it has been a, a journey. I'm in my, I'm 52. Um, and the journey for me started when I was 15 years old. So, And you were involved, uh, I believe, one of the the deep dives you took. Oh, by the way, just because I hadn't heard this before, how long did you live in Nepal? Oh, I was only there about six months. The issue with Nepal, at, at least at the time I was there, I don't imagine it's changed. It's really easy to get a job teaching English, but very hard. At the time, there was only uh, one school and a second one was opening where you could teach English and get a visa. So essentially, you would have to leave the country every you know, 90 days or something, and all of the money you made teaching English for three months went to a plane flight, and then you had to fly back, and I couldn't afford that at the time. I was under the impression, because um, someone lied to me, that they had gotten me a job at the English teaching school that could give you a visa to stay in the country. So I went there. They had never heard of me. Um, and so from there... <laughs> Uh, I decided to figure out what to do and became active in a couple of uh, Buddhist temples and ended up hiking the Annapuran mountain range, which is what separates Nepal from India, not the Himalayas, um, and hiking around there and had a wonderful time and came to the realization that, and I had never been happier before. So I was very unhappy as a child. This might have been my first encounter with true happiness. And I was, you know, so I was hiking down, came to this, this little meadow that was the top of a cliff, looking up a river valley and 
said to myself before I completely drop out of society and just follow my happiness, I should try to do something good in the world. And the second thought I had was no one will listen to me if I don't go get a college degree. And I had already been accepted at a small school, St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland. They have a sister campus in Santa Fe. And I had been deferring and deferring while I was traveling around the world and said, okay, I'm going back to go to school. That might have been the single worst decision I ever made in my life. <laughs> but nonetheless, it set me on a very different trajectory. And, uh, and here we are now. So, so, so you were in, in Nepal for six months, the first, your first encounter with true happiness. And in the midst of that, you had the altruistic urge to... I abandoned it to go do something good for the world. Well, you know, I don't know. It might have been a good choice. Who knows what would have happened? My life's not over, but it, 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 I don't think it weighs out so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Um, there's, always, there's always more time. That's so, true. There's always tomorrow. So then... You, you know, we just went into a little bit of your seeking history and you mentioned going to San Francisco to get into trading. But of course, trading and finance and the pursuit of enlightenment and spirituality aren't necessarily two worlds one automatically puts together in their mind. So how did you get into the pursuit of, of being a trader and, and pursuing the world of finance? And how did that relate to your spiritual path, if at all? So I was, <clears throat> I came back from Nepal when I was 21 or something, 22. And when I went to San Francisco, I was now 27 or 28. So there's five years in between. So I had thought about becoming a psychologist. My, um, I transferred from St. John's to UCLA because I like rowing. I was on the crew team and I wanted to be at a bigger school. I graduated with a degree in psychology um, with the idea, intention at the time of going to get a, a master's or doctorate, becoming a psychologist, decided I did not although deeply interested in the field, did not like what I see emerging in the field, decided not to go that direction. I'm the kind of person that um, didn't really recognize that I had any passion. There was nothing, you know, well, what's your dream job? You know, I, blank. <laughs> what do you really want to do with your life? What makes you happy? Blank. Um, so if there was nothing for me to, to pursue from a desire standpoint, and if I'm going to stay here, make money and trading matched up with, you know, not in some obvious ways, but my skill set. I was um, an athlete. I was on the crew team. I was highly competitive. Um, I like competitive environments. I like the fight and tension that goes on. And trading seemed to be something that matched those skills. And I wouldn't have to, I hated school, so I wouldn't have to go to more graduate school into a field that I didn't really want to be a part of anymore. Um, so in some ways I fell into trading, um, but in other ways it was a natural fit. And then for years had to, I struggled with, um, kind of three main things. One being a good trader, being very successful, wanting to be very successful Two, had some socialistic tendencies right? <laughs> and that doesn't quite fit with the world of trading. And then also the spiritual bent that I had. How do these things go together? Am I taking from society? What am I giving? You know, blah, 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 blah. And while those tensions, you know, certainly were real in me, certainly had a negative impact in every direction of my area of life, not just a negative impact on trading, but also a negative impact on spiritual pursuits. And I put that in quotes. Um, but that kind of internal tension, divided intention, conflicted intention, creates subpar lives and real damage in the world around us and inside of us. That's one of the things that I have spent decades working through 
and finding new solutions and also seeing that much of what I perceived as a conflict was completely imaginary and created by myself. Mm. And one of the reasons we're talking today is a conversation um, that began and you said, oh, we should record this. And it was about um, creativity. Right. And you being interested in creativity. So some of the questions I have for you are, what do you mean by creativity? But part of where I'm going with that question is my way out of those types of conflicts were creative solutions, creatively seeing my life in a way that I hadn't or wasn't willing to see it in before. That's the first step of it uh, for me in, in that kind of quagmire. Um, culturally, culturally, our, our, our country, you know, spiritual people, oh, business is bad. Business people, oh, the spiritual people, you know, and I'm talking in platitudes, but the reality is most of the most successful businessmen meditate. Mm -hmm. They may not meditate for the same reason someone goes on a retreat to India. They may be doing it for all kinds of different reasons and they are meditating and getting the benefits of it, and it is changing their perspective on the world. Right. When spiritual people who think, you know, and again, I'm speaking in platitudes, you know, oh, there's, you know, no justice in the world, there's only harm, we gotta fix all of this stuff. It's not that what they're noticing isn't true, true in the sense that yes, there's racism. Yes, there's abject poverty when there doesn't need to be this level of poverty. Yes, there is greed and accumulation, but the drive between, behind that greed and accumulation is fear. The drive behind me getting into a spiritual life was fear. America right now is driven and the world is driven by fear. And as the virus is spreading all over, the fear just got ratcheted up. Now, is there a creative way for me to be experiencing the life that I'm currently in, whether I got as far as I thought I had or I was claiming things that weren't completely true or always true, that I can put into place right now to move myself and everything forward right now? I'm going to tell a story that doesn't totally relate to what you just said. In the hopes that I'm going to circle back to your point about creativity, uh, but the story, I just want to inject this fairly early in the conversation so that it can inform us as we keep moving, is, is the story that you and I share. And it has to do with this, as I said, we were involved in a small group of people, generally five, over four years. We'd meet every week by conference call and twice a year for retreats. And many amazing things happened during that time. It was, I think, an incredibly influential experience for all of us who are involved. Uh, but the one thing I wanted to, to mention was a, a particular retreat where uh, at the very start, uh, I essentially challenged all of us to give up any aspiration for the future in, this, in the sense that rather than relating to this the retreat that was about to happen hadn't happened yet because this was the very first session. Rather than intending for it to become the most important and weekend of our lives, we should simply step into the recognition that it already is the most important weekend in our lives and then live the weekend knowing that. Now, whether it remained that way after seven years really doesn't matter whether it still is doesn't matter but it speaks to not just the power of intention which is massive and i'll let you get back to the story as soon as i'm done interrupting but that we actually create our lives yes and the way we actually create our lives most of us even if we buy into that idea, are unaware of how and at what level of self we're actually doing that at. So the, the point is, um, 
that moment occurred and I will never forget it uh, because something happened collectively to that small group of people and nothing changed and everything was different. Uh, you know, we were all there wearing the same clothes in a circle. Right. I think we were in Copenhagen. Uh, we were. In a beautiful place. And yet it was, it was literally like there was a moment of shimmering and suddenly, and then you realize you weren't in the same world you were in a second ago, that somehow we'd entered a different level of creative control over, over the lives we were actually living. And then that weekend occurred in that new sense of, of reality. So you had said earlier, how would I define creativity? And, and I think this is where you and I, you know, we really bond because I actually don't, from one point of view, I don't really believe that human beings are creative. I believe that the universe is creative and that that creativity uh, can be channeled through the human, through the human vehicle. And, and that, that was an example because the idea that we weren't going to know if this weekend was the most significant until the weekend was over and, and time went by and we could tell, which is why you're saying it doesn't really matter what happened later. That was the whole point. When we got rid of that idea and, and stepped into the recognition that it was the most significant and that intention didn't mean let's try and hope. Intention means it is. Literally, we were enacting some kind of deep creative potential that exists in the universe and can be manifest by human beings that literally and, and you know, there's no way to really explain what happened, but everything changed or, or nothing changed from a certain superficial point of view. And yet everything was different. It was a kind of paradigm shift in which we all stepped into a different world together. Um, and so I guess that's, that's the level of creativity that, I, that, that lives between you and I. You know, every time you and I right. speak, that's that's always what emerges even if i have for whatever reason gotten distracted by other things as soon as you and i speak that possibility is what is alive and we both know that it's real and that it happened that's right right yes and whenever i hear you you know i, I listen to your recordings you do free stuff and and all of that and and recently um in, in one of your latest books, um, you know, you, you mentioned, oh, doing your dream job. You can make money doing your dream job, but only if you're not doing it for the money. If you're purely following your passion for the sake of the passion, lots of wonderful other things will happen. But if you're following your passion for the sake of making money primarily, everything gets muted. Now on that weekend, you know, it's a bold statement. This is the most significant weekend of our lives. And most of us, if we're even willing to make a statement like that, periodically want to check in. Okay, we have 48 hours left. Are we on track? <laughs> you know, do we need to, to work extra hard to make this the most special? Oh, we're, okay, we're ahead of schedule. I can relax a little bit. It's going to be okay. We're going to make it to the most significant weekend. And when the weekend's over, then I will know if it was the most significant weekend or not, or if I needed to work harder. And I'll do a, you know, a, a post retreat assessment and where did I fall short? And oh, if I, if I had only really meditated that hour, not just 55 minutes, then it would have been the most significant. Every time I move to that position during the weekend, to that position, I fell out of the space you were talking about to the point where, oh, we're sitting in a circle I'm physically here. I can see I'm not part of what's going on anymore. And as soon as I switch, dropped my attention to that, which on the surface, you know, seems good, seems reasonable, is how most people live most of their lives when they're trying to accomplish something. When I let go of that and returned to the position, this is the most significant. I was back in the circle. It was the most significant, I'm mixing tenses here, but in present time, it was the most significant. And it's not just that there wasn't care or concern, 
are we on track? There was no reason to have the care or concern because it was true right now. Right. <clears throat> and in that truth, everything looks completely different. Now, that truth resides in us. That was a level of self that I got to have an inner, uh, uh, that I was aware of the interaction at a depth of self that previously I had only thought about, imagined, hoped was true. So the next question and what I've been um, exploring since then, what can happen, what is necessary, however you wanna phrase it, for me and consequently for others, to access that level of self with awareness consistently. Right. So I want to relate this back to something you said earlier on, because I think it's now, we're now in a position to address something in a way that, that's, that's very interesting. So we gave the example of this experience of a weekend. And of course, every time we speak about that together, I'm, I'm more aware of the significance that that, that group had uh, on me and, and the experiences we had in various retreats. But we spoke specifically about this moment where we stepped into this is the most significant weekend, right? We were, we were deciding, right. we were saying, I'm not going to wait till the weekend is over. I am going to step into a reality right now. And that's right. it, right? And so the, what I wanted to, to reflect back on is, because you just said, well, we could do that with anything. And it's been occurring to me, we could do that with this whole pandemic. Yes. How are we relating to this? Because there's, there's a certain way in which, for the most part, you know, and I'm, you know, these things are totally understandable. So it's not like anybody's wrong. But for the most part, it's the easiest thing to relate to this is a global tragedy, the proportions of which nobody alive has ever seen before. Uh, Another way to relate to it would be that this is the most significant event to happen in human history in our lifetimes, in a positive sense. And, and to not wait and see if that's going to be the case, but right. live as if, live that reality now in the middle of it. And, and how would that change? You know, if you took, if you could run an experiment where you had a control earth in an experiment, <laughs> right? And on the, on the control earth, by and large, the dominant emotion around all this was, was fear generated by the idea that this is the, the worst tragedy to happen in a lifetime. And then on the experimental earth, you could somehow magically get everyone to relate to this as if it was the, it was the biggest opportunity. Sp yeah, spiritual opportunity to come along in a lifetime. And then would that shift change the outcome of, of what this resulted to in, in the end? So I want to bring it down to a much smaller human scale. And it applies in both areas. We just have to have the strength and courage and willingness to do it. So <clears throat> uh, 12 years ago, um, the, uh, the woman I'm with, my partner, um, lost her job, as many people did. And she was in sales and lost the job. It wasn't easy to find another job. She's a hustler, got, you know, two, three jobs, started her own business in one, that flopped. She wasn't having any sales in this new business. Now there's a crisis of confidence. Am I a good salesperson? Am I a bad salesperson? Was I lucky before? What's going on? Um, she worked through all of that, kept plugging away, ended up in real estate, and real estate is a perfect match for her type of sales. She's relationship building instead of closing. Now, at some point in this journey, right, and, and when she lost the job, there was a, a, a point where she broke down and, and all there was to do was hold her. Right. There's no talking to her. She was unconsolably heartbroken and worried about her future. 
Now, that type of release, that cathartic release, was also a turning point for her. But at some point, three, three and a half years later, she loves what she's doing. There's more opportunity, less stress, more happiness. And she now looks back and is so grateful that she got fired in 2008. Mm. So happy because if the company had figured out how to keep her and then she had moved into, you know, she was already in upper management. She was the national sales director. But if she had moved into the top two or three of the company, which is what the plan was and buy out the owner, she would not be as happy as she is now. She would not feel as empowered as she is now. She would not have had the satisfaction of building her own business, right? She works for a real estate company, but they're all independent and she built her own without that tragedy. Now, the question you're asking is, is it possible for her to feel grateful in the moment, not three and a half years later? If she was grateful in the moment, what would those intervening three years been like? What more could have been created from a feeling of gratefulness, abundantness, not lack, not fear, not tragedy? What are we creating when we're in these different energy fields and spaces? What's the motivation we hold that creates my thinking and feeling going to these different perspectives, gratitude or pain and suffering? We all go through experiences like this. There's all stuff we look back at and like, oh, that wasn't that bad, or I'm even glad it happened. Right. You're interested in bringing in a paradigm of new creativity. And I'm interested in that, and I'm interested in the application and the nuts and bolts of how to do that. And I've been in that exploration, and, you know, and, and you're gangbusters in that exploration. There are also things that we know today that we are on a trajectory for that if humans are not at a new level of creativity, it will be utterly tragic for the human race. Mm -hmm. And the beginnings of that new world from a physical sense, we might track back to this virus and this time of globally shutting down of realizing, wait a minute, there's a different way to be organized and come together than what we've been doing. And what we've been doing is an extension of the industrial revolution. We gather and find social need and build cities the way it was appropriate to do for the industrial revolution. The needs of the industrial revolution no longer exist for mm -hmm. most of humanity in most places. But again, that social structure is based on productivity needs of the Industrial Revolution. That's it. That's why we have cities the way we do. Now that we don't need that, what is the organizing, social organizing principle that makes sense for an information age, a post-post-post-information age economy? Right now, let's let, let's really explode this for a second. When AI comes online, if we get nanobots together, if technology brings about a day where the human is no longer needed or only needed at 10% of what it is today or 5% or 1%, the day of mass employment by the biggest and best and most productive and most interesting companies is done. That's not coming back. We're not having new companies like GM. They're going to hire a million people. It's not necessary anymore. We will have companies like GM that produce the level of cars and it will all be automated in that world. The only thing that matters, not the only thing, there's probably lots of things that matters, but a crucial question that matters is what is the value of a human being? And from a cultural and societal standpoint, that value is what you do, what your right. job is, what you produce. Well, that anchor of the value of a human being won't be available for us in the future I'm talking about. 
And it's a glorious future I'm talking about. So if the value of a human being isn't what I produce or what my relationship to production is, what is the value of a human being? And the best answer I can come up with is creativity. The value of a human being is not what I create, but being creative. I think in order to, um, you know, in order to embrace what you're saying, you know, it's like, you know, because you're speaking about a massive shift in paradigm that's, mm -hmm. that's initiated by a fundamental shift in how we view ourselves, how we view our value as human beings. And in order to appreciate how different a world that can be, we have to realize how deeply embedded we are right. in the idea that, that essentially, again, as you said, it's kind of a world coming out of the enlightenment, a world coming out of the industrial revolution, which, which essentially views a human being as a worker, as, a, right. as someone who's producing something of value for the rest of the world. And that's when, you know, obviously in America, we probably have a particular flavor of that, but we all know that one of the first things we talk to someone about when we meet them is what they do. And what <laughs> right. they do means what do they produce, right? Because, you know, if you think about it, we do a lot of things. I eat, I drink, uh, I, I read, I write, you know, but when, when you say, what do you do? Everyone knows what you're talking about. It means, what do you do to earn a living? And the whole idea that you have to earn a living, the, even in that uh, terminology, is the idea that the way that you earn the right to live has to do with what you're able to produce, what your, right. what, what your value is as a worker, as a, as a part of this machinery. So that fundamental view of, of being a human being creates a certain world. Again, if we could think about it in terms of uh, a, a controlled experiment, if you had one world where human beings were conditioned to see their value as, as, as what they produce, and you had a world where you had a whole world of human beings who saw their value as, as, as not what they produce, but, but the creativity that they express, what happens? So now it's back to that most significant weekend in Copenhagen. It's not the output of my creativity, right? Because that's the paradigm we're in now. Oh, I'm an artist and this is what I produce right. and this is how I show value. There will be an output. It may or may not have value, but what's the level of creativity that I participate in right now while doing it? And that is a completely different shift in focus and paradigm. And you can see that the, 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 when the value of a human being is what they produce, then in effect, a human being has no value. Right. Right. They, they, if, the, if, if the value of a human being is what they actually are as an expression of creativity, then they do, they have a kind of inherent value. Not, because it's not about what they create. It's not the product that has the value and therefore they have a kind of secondary value based on the fact that they produce that thing. But they have a primary value because they are creative. And I guess the thing to, to contemplate there is, again, what kind of world do we live in when people are immediately aware of the value of being human, and that this is, that this is a, a valuable, uh, this is an inherently valuable thing to be human. And, and how does one, how do we relate to each other? How do we relate to ourselves? What kind of world do we create from a place of inherent value versus a place where we are conditioned to, to be constantly needing to produce in order to prove that we have value. So at the beginning of this call, you talked about creativity kind of moving through a person. That the, you, people aren't creative, the universe is creative. And when I'm in heightened points of what I identify as being creative, it does feel like it's flowing through me. Yes, they're my thoughts, but I'm not generating them. Right. 
yes, the next action I'm taking, but it's not from the familiar sense of self or part of me, and it doesn't even feel quite like me. It feels like it's flowing through. When we inhabit and come from a place that's beyond ego, I don't have to become happy. I don't have to find love. That's already there, and it's all that's there. This effervescent, ever-flowing, achingly beautiful, complete love is present all around us all the time. It's my thought process, my disposition, my internal states that keep it at bay. So now, if I drop the pretense, what's there? Love. If I'm in right now, not going to be creative, not being creative for the output. If I'm creative right now, I'm in that space where love and gratitude is all that seems to be there. So what, so what you're asking is what world gets created when there is massive levels of productivity, we are not in need of or want of anything. I'm not creating things to do something, although something will be done. I am present and wake up and I am creative right now and I'm interacting with you and all there is is love. How do we shift paradigms? If we start the work now, we will be in excellent position when the transition is thrust upon us. Right. Now what happens if we do lots of work in this area? It's very exciting. Right. And, and this is one of, the, one of the ways that I see this whole period around COVID-19 is... Right. This is a tragedy. There's no doubt about it. And people are dying and people are losing their livelihoods. And, and we're, we're all experiencing a kind of mass trauma as a result of the fear and tension that's being generated. So there's no way to make this a positive thing in any, any immediate sense. And this is not the biggest crisis that we're facing as a planet. This is, this right. is, the, one that's, this is the one that's hitting first. And, and one, of the, one of the great benefits of this is I think we're getting a glimpse of how unprepared we actually are for right. a, 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 an event of this scale. But, but, you know, if the science is true, when climate change really starts to hit in the way that COVID-19 is, it, it's going to make COVID-19 look like the good old days. Right. You know, com compared to what we still had homes and electricity to go to. <laughs> right. You know, right. So, <laughs> so hopefully this is going to, you know, hopefully part of the, of what the world will gain from, from, from all the tragedy and all the challenges that, that are currently being dealt with and faced is that this will trigger a shift or at least the beginning, as you, as you were just saying, the beginning of, of a significant amount of human energy being devoted to consciously moving toward a shift in paradigm, part of which, as we've been talking about, means shifting the way we value human life and what we value about being human. Uh, and so that we can absorb, we can be ready for whatever's next. So if I'm gonna have a paradigm shift, and you've mentioned this before, one of the challenges is when I go to the new paradigm, it's unfamiliar. Unfamiliar for many of us is uncomfortable to some degree. If it's unfamiliar and I'm uncomfortable, I'm going to want to switch back to what's comfortable and familiar. The only gauge of that is my experience. So if I can loosen my relationship to my experience so that I'm not gauging new as uncomfortable or unfamiliar or making meaning that it's good or bad, can I then spend more time in this new paradigm and see if it's a paradigm that makes sense that I would want to be in? Now we're in something wonderfully circular. I want to create the paradigm of creativity. Well, what's wonderfully circular about it is I can't look to the paradigm to be created. I'm trying to create it. I can't look to the past for creativity in this new paradigm. The only place it can happen. I've now locked myself in. The only place it can happen is right now, which is what's always the case. 
but we do this song and dance, I'll go to the new paradigm next week. Oh, I'll prepare myself. I'm going to meditate for seven days and then I'll go to it, right? Yeah, you may get there doing that. But you're fundamentally reinforcing the old paradigm that something in the future is going to happen that will alleviate whatever I'm worried about, angry about, fearful about, happy about right now. Right. And, and that brings us right back to that experience in Copenhagen, in Copenhagen. Which, was, right. which was all about giving up the idea that something was going to happen and being in it now. Like to me, this is a jumping off point now of the conversation that's, that's so exciting. I feel the same exact way. And I think what I'll do is I'm just going to say we have to talk again. Uh, and I know that you are starting to do more coaching work. I know that you've been working and gestating a lot of these ideas and we've been doing that together in, in different ways. And I also know, and I feel that you're poised to bring a lot of the experience you've had and perspectives uh, that you have to share uh, and make them more available. And I look forward to seeing more and more of what you have to bring to the world available so that we can, so that you can make good on your decision to leave Nepal uh, yeah. <laughs> so long ago. Maybe it will all work out. <laughs> I'm, I, think it, I think it already has, so we'll see. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Jeff. I've enjoyed this immensely. Um, thank you for the shout out about the, the, um, me exposing myself more to um, work with other people. I've been doing it for four or five years um, on, a, uh, on the down low. I guess it's, would it be true? Um, now I'm making myself more available. If anyone's interested, um, you can contact me through Jeff. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you Take so care. much. I love you so much, Jeff. Um, thank you. Love you too. Bye now. Bye.